you know, there were many, many parties last night, so you're the real diehards, though, to come here this morning. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday morning keynote speech. Um, uh, before we get started, I just want to remind you of the process for asking questions of the speaker. We have student volunteers who will walk slowly up and down the aisles with index cards, and if you would just raise your hand, they'll pass a card down to you. Just write your question down, and they'll bring it up here, and then uh, we'll, we'll sort those and ask the speaker. Uh, also, I wanted to suggest that you sit as close to the front as possible to avoid the background echo in this large room. Okay. Without any more ado, I want to introduce our speaker, Dr. David Min from LG Electronics. He's a senior research fellow there and heads the Software Center. Um, he's best known for having spearheaded the smart TV platform from LG Electronics, which was an enormous success. I was at Samsung at the time, and believe me, we got scolded for what a success the LG smart TV was. Um, he's, uh, he received a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from Seoul National University, uh, Master of Science from the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, and PhD from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's held positions at uh, Digital Equipment, Microsoft, Samsung, and he's been at LG since 2006. Um, on a personal note, when I asked Dr. Min what's his, what his hobbies are, he, t he told me that he really spends most of his time trying to take care of his two sons and also his 1,500 people on his team. And I just think that shows his commitment to people while he's also building technology. So, welcome Dr. Min. Thank you, Bo, for the great introduction about myself. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> well, so, you know, I'm so honored to be out here to have a chance to talk to uh, people from uh, various countries, having this great conference on human-computer interface. I know about this conference many, many years, but then opportunity to have a keynote speech is such, such a, you know, you know, if, you know, rare opportunity for me. I hope that uh, my talk this morning will, you know, help you some uh, understanding about uh, what we are trying to do at LG and many other things as well. So my talk today is about journey to a better life. So we are gathered here this morning. We, we talk about human-computer interface. And the most topics we will discuss this week, we are discussing this week, is about how we can make such an interface good enough so that our daily life can benefit from it. However, before we talk about, about such topics, about how we make such an interface good enough, I think that we better look around us, spend a few moments to see what a good life we are enjoying these days. They say humans are an animal of forgetfulness. We tend to forget our past very, very quickly. Just think about last uh, 10 or 20 years, all those technological amenities which came to us. You know, smartphones, flat panel TVs, World Wide Web, and high definition TV broadcasting, so many things. Well, I'm not going to talk about all these things this morning. But because we are having this conference right here in Seoul, Korea, I'd like to begin my talk by uh, telling you a little bit about the information technology-based services, which are rather unique in Korea, in Seoul, and which are unknown to the other part of the world, and which makes people's life better. Before I do that, I think that I'd like to get, uh, have some context in terms of Seoul, Korea, and the pe uh, no, people living in Korea. So Seoul and its uh, close by area is a large, one of the largest uh, you know, metropolitan area in the world. And out of a uh, co Korean population of 50 million people, about 25, peop 25 million people living in this metropolitan area. So if you compare it with the New York metropolitan area, New York is about twice as big as in the Seoul area. But however, population wise, uh, Seoul is about one half times larger or bigger than New York area. 
This is a picture of Seoul taken about half a century ago, about 50 years ago. Just compare that with this another picture taken recently. So what an amazing transformation. As the city's infrastructure gets better, the life in the city has dramatically improved over the years. Koreans are also very dynamic and outgoing. So oftentimes for an important event, they want to express their opinions and feelings. So for a, you know, some you know, important event, we oftentimes see a gathering of humongous number of people gathered together. So this is a picture we took about uh, during the World Cup event about 10 years ago, and people gathered right in front of the city hall. Another picture about you know, the uh, music concert offered by the world famous you know, musician, Sai, uh, taken a couple of years ago. So people living so close to each other, any new fashion or services, you know, if it is uh, popular, it gets spread very, very quickly. So the city government, when they want to offer something like internet services, they try to make sure that such services are available to, to everybody because people don't want to be left behind. So now the, uh, the city is now boosting you know, one of the best places in the world in terms of uh, network infrastructures. So network speed, the most fast fastest, and the penetration is almost 100%. So when any new services are kind of offered, and when it is found to be useful, everybody start to use right away. So let me show you a couple of slides showing you a few interesting services that are popular in Korea. This is called what they call e-bus service. This is a you know, bus services and the route of, of this bus is collectively decided by the passengers ahead of time. So they kind of request their, you know, uh, their you know, ideal route and then the bus will, the route will be decided you know, as people want. The another one is about what they call late night owl bus service. This is a, a service for those who need public transportation during the wee hours, like uh, midnight till 4 a.m. So the city collects the data, location data of the people and the location data of the taxis during those hours and then kind of uh, have some rough idea about where people spend the night and where people go back home. So with some big data analysis, the city offers the public transportation bus route for those route where people will most likely take such, uh, during such odd hours. And this service is, became very, very popular right from the beginning. This is yet another service, what we call Deri Unjan, which is in English, I would say, hired chauffeur service. This is for those who spend the night with people doing, having some alcohol and have to re go back home, drive back home. So then they can easily obtain a chauffeur service. So they don't have to worry about having to drive back home at such a late hours after a social gathering. In fact, today, if you see the, you know, I don't, I don't know how many, but the, in the TV news, they were talking about taxi app, where they call the taxis using a mobile phone apps, and then taxi come to you wherever you are because of the location data. It's very popular. Such a very interesting service is rather unique in Seoul and the nearby metropolitan areas. You know, obviously, it's not just the city government who are trying to make people's life better. The companies, device manufacturers, as well as the service providers, they are trying to also provide some nice services so that to make the people's life better. So uh, let me show you a video clip uh, about the, you know, the, the, uh, the such effort being made by the company LG, the company that I work for, and the content, the, the uh, effort is about the, uh, you know, mobile phones and TVs and some services to control the home appliances. It's about a minute of uh, or so the video content. Okay.
All right, so uh, maybe some of you already familiar with these services, this effort by, uh, from LG, and some of you may even have bought and now using the LG products. Now, obviously, it's not just LG, but many other companies. We, they are all trying to make you know, some effort, try to make our people's life better. So it seems that we are living in such a good life these days, enjoying many great technologies. But we all know that we will see many new technological improvements and new services and new products will appear over time. And we all also know that such rate of changes, rate of improvement will at least be the same or even the quicker. So the question is, what's the driving force behind all these changes? You know, I, I believe there are three factors. The first one is about the improvement, the ever improving semiconductor technologies, and then also the ever faster and ubiquitous internet, and the endless, seemingly endless evolution of the web. This picture illustrates the, the incredible improvement of the, uh, we have seen regarding semiconductor technologies. In fact, last Sunday was, uh, you know, the, uh, where the, you, I, many of you might know the Moore's law, which is about the semiconductor, you know, the density will get improved in twice in about 18 months. So this is about, in nine years, the three megabyte per one dollar, for the same dollar, after nine years, we were able to buy 1,300 megabytes, you know, so it's kind of an unbelievable improvement. But it's not just, uh, you know, computer chips for storage alone. You know, in many consumer electronics devices like mobile phones, the processing power inside such a device is, if you think about 20 years ago, it would be like a supercomputer processing power. It's amazing, isn't it, if we just think about it. What about the internet? 20 years ago, image download, we will be very happy if it you know, fin finishes a, a couple of seconds quicker. But the, you know, these days, we will see the movie video streamed over the internet without any network hiccups or any picture quality you know, problems. So 20 years ago, it seems like you know, WWW, it seems like it stands for worldwide weight. Now, it looks like the WWW stands for really worldwide wow. What about the web? The evolution of web content and structure is also very, very amazing. You know, 20 years ago, the web was a medium for sharing static information. So portals like uh, American Online will seem to, uh, seem to you know, dominate the world. But now, the... Uh, these days, the web enables very dynamic services, such as you know, social networking or online purchasing, and so on, you know, which are unthinkable without the web. So what's the future of the web? Web 3.0, web, web 4.0, what do they mean? I don't know. Without the ability to predict the future, we commonly talk about such nice fancy terms like uh, you know, personalization, or content curation, or even you know, semantic web, and even companies like us, we are talking about platforms using web technologies, such as Chrome OS, Firefox OS, Tizen, or WebOS. So who can imagine what will happen in the next you know, 10, 10 or 20 years? Whatever the you know, future development will be, these three factors, semiconductors, the internet, and the web will be the driving force behind all these developments. So what's possible beyond what's available to us right now? What are the opportunities? What kind of better life lie ahead of us? Let me share with you a video clip suggesting what it will be like you know, in the future at our home. Just one more video.
I'm back. <laughs>
human computer interfaces can help you know, design improved regulations as well, just as they can you know, solve the, the, the problem of uh, connectivity as well as the improve the you know, privacy and security issues. You know, however, to reach the full promise of a, a human, uh, uh, full promise of human computer interface skills, we need improved human human interface skills. Without making progress in that area, the biggest hurdles may remain unsolved. That is, the best of a CHI, a computer human interface, depends upon the success in what we may call HHI, human human interface. That's because sometimes the biggest hurdles sometimes can be found around us to our development teams. Product managers, developers, and designers who should work together to solve product challenges by brainstorming and idea gathering sometimes cannot agree on a plan and they go separate way and then resulting in a partial and half-baked solution. If we really want to contribute to society, we need to somehow figure out how we can take advantage of collective wisdom instead of solely relying upon individual creativity. Yes, collaboration is something which is easy to talk about, but actually not so easy to, to really apply in the real world. Here is a slide that comically illustrates how differently we are perceived by others in different profession. To a designer, developer seems to be somebody who is hiding behind the dark cubicle, writing software code without too much care about the end customers. You know, to a designer, uh, no, to a developer, a designer is rather a naive baby, you know, imagining something which is only possible in an imaginary world, and so on. As a software professional, I have been involved in a number of uh, projects over the years. Uh, during my long career of software industry, I have seen quite a, uh, quite a few times when collaboration played a key part in the success and failure of a project. Let me, show you, uh, let me share with you one particular experience I had in my you know, young software engineering you know, days. The first company I worked right after school was a company doing import-export trading business, one of the largest one in, the, in Korea. I worked in the electronic data processing department of the, of the company. And then I, I, I think I was very fortunate because I joined an you know, organization where we have a very, very insightful manager. You know, instead of working on projects on automating business processes such as uh, payroll or accounting, I was asked to lead a project that enables data entry terminals which are used you know, all over the department in the company to be used as a device to send and receive messages from overseas department. In those days, there were no email and no internet. There were telex devices and telex typists. And overseas communication goes through the telex room. Messages from the overseas branches are received at the telex room and hard copy made and hand delivered to the recipient department. Similarly, when someone wants to send a message to an overseas offices, he has to submit the message to the telex room in hard copy, and which then get typed by the typist and sent it over to the telex uh, using the telex device. You know, developing an electronic mail system involved participation of you know, many people with skills in many different information technology skills, such as communi uh, communication network management, uh, controller management, and database, application development, operating system, and so forth. My role in this project was working as a program manager, doing whatever not covered by somebody. I managed an oper you know, outsourcing software company uh, who, uh, who are responsible for developing device drivers for doing some protocol conversion. And I also defined addresses for all the departments in the company 
And I also wrote user manual and operation manual where using uh, some word processor software, which you know, appeared uh, at the time, and so forth. You know, after a difficult hard work of almost one year, about 12 months, we were able to launch the you know, system, and the system soon became a very important part of the IT system for the company. You know, because you know, for an import and export trading company, message communication is very important part and should be handled very efficiently. I felt very great for being able to make such an impact to the company and I felt the importance of collaboration you know, early on because the success of the project would not have been possible without the great teamwork that uh, so many people you know, who participated in the project, you know, they devoted for the project. That was many years ago. Now at LG, I'm leading an effort to develop common reusable software platform that can be used for many products the company makes. To do this, a couple of years ago, we took over the world famous operating system called WebOS and then tried to customize it to fit our needs. The WebOS TV video I've shown earlier was the result of that effort. You know, this is an endeavor of several hundred people working all over the you know, globe with the different languages, with the different cultures, they work in a different time zones, which makes it very difficult to work together. So the real challenge in this project is to figure out how we can find the common ground to, you know, to collaborate, in, you know, suppressing the urge, thinking that I can do better than these guys over there. You know, the another one, the open source movement is a good example which shows the potential of the, you know, successful collaboration. You know, Linux, the most well-known, you know, such a movement is now used all over the place. You know, inside consumer electronics devices such as mobile phones and TVs and inside the big internet companies like uh, Facebook, Google or Naver. Another example of extensive collaboration can be found in how phones are made. In addition to uh, all the software that's inside the phone, just think about all those hardware components needed to make a phone. You know, screen, LCD displays, cameras, and processors, and memories, and batteries, you know. All these component suppliers have to work together to make a great modern consumer electronics devices like, like a phone. You know, another aspect of collaboration can be seen in a value chain. For any internet services such as Facebook or Kakao Talk, we know in order to make it available, you know, service providers, network operators, and the platform providers and device manufacturers, they all have to work together. Steve Jobs once famously said, what he had done was nothing but finding a, you know, co in a crossroad between liberal art and technology. The next new set of great devices or great products, which are presently unknown to us, may emerge from a group of people who know how to synergize talents from diverse fields of knowledge, such as liberal art, architecture, natural science, or medicine, and so forth. So, as a final note, I'd like to invite you, all of you, the designers and developers who gathered here this week to attend this conference on human computer interface to contemplate again the importance of collaboration to contribute to human society. With so many possibilities for a better world uh, lie ahead of us, it's time to look, back, look at ourselves again look at our co-workers with a new perspective and to think about how we can work together you know, better. You know, they say, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. Thank you this morning for hearing my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was great. Here, please, Thank come you. have a seat. I have to sit there? Please. Yeah.
I have a few questions <laughs> from the audience. Okay. First, I want to thank you for taking us on a great journey, and I'm always reminded at uh, how fortunate we are to live in these times. Um, I wanted to touch on, uh, you mentioned a couple times that it would be great to also extend these, uh, the, the wonders of our lives to disadvantaged people. And I was wondering if you have some thoughts about how we can take technologies into uh, underdeveloped parts of the world and uh, help improve lives okay. beyond just yeah. the modern societies. You make such a good question. In fact, my second son is doing this kind of NGO activity in Los Angeles. Really? He has a program called Water Bomb, which is kind of collecting funds to make some distilled, you know, water bottle that distills the water. And so that it, it, he can collect all these bottles to send it over to underdeveloped, you know, regions in the world like Africa. Mm. So I think that developing such a device, kind of distilling the water, mm -hmm. is one such a good example. Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> is, it, is it an electronic device? or it's uh, Not electronic device. Yeah, I don't know how they do that. You perhaps. just put some kind of, uh, some kind of filthy water, uh -huh. you get you uh -huh. know, distilled somehow. Uh -huh. you know, there's such a device. Okay. Fascinating. So another question I wanted to ask was, um, in addition to the techn technology journeys you took us on, what's your favorite journey in your whole life? My favorite journey? <laughs> Oh, that's not an easy question, but then, you know, generally, I like to read classic books, uh -huh. and uh, in, in many classic books, they talk about a lot of life story. I feel like I'm kind of taking the same life story, kind of a journey to me, too. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, so a lot of the videos you showed were about having a better life indoors at your home. Um, what do you think about the role of smart technologies uh, to help play and improve in your outdoor and in your business life as well? Well, if you say outdoors, to me, the first thing that I come to mind is, uh, to my mind, is about, you know, watch providing <laughs> the, the distance from the, you know, from the green to where I am in terms when I play golf. <laughs> like 150 yards, 200 yards, that helps me a lot. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think that the outdoor life, you know, a lot of times people are talking about doing some kind of a, kind of a fitness kind of application for my, our mobile devices. That's where the, you know, these uh, uh, opportunities are, I think. For the business, well, I think that uh, I can be, you know, it can be the same that the, my, our, you know, wearable devices can help me connect to many business activities happening with, to, you know, with, my, with my co-workers as well. To sort of broaden your awareness of what, what's going on right. in your work right. life. Yeah. So I wanted to say personally that one of the, the uh, concepts that I loved the most in your talk was the human-to-human -human interaction. Uh, I feel like it gets lost a lot of times, <coughs> even among uh, those of us who are very aware that the humans are going to be interacting with the technology. And I just wondered, though, in your teams as a leader, how do you remind people to keep HHI in the forefront of their thinking as they're doing their work? Yeah, actually for that, you know, I oftentimes use the, the three famous motors mm. that the Apple company, uh, when as first started, the, the president of the company says, the first one is about empathy, which is about thinking about your, your customers. If you wear your, in the customer's head, how do you feel about what you provide? That's the one big message I keep telling to our people, among others, topics which is like uh, focus and input. Empathy is the most important part of it. Okay. So coworkers, we have to be more, have uh, empathy in our mind mm -hmm. to work together. Another question I had was, you've, you've taken keep a coming. journey. <laughs> you've taken a journey yourself, I think, in uh, from your, your engineering background to having an appreciation for design thinking in your, your product development. And I just wondered if you could say something about maybe what was the first time you realized that you were, you were taking a more, uh, more input from design than you expected to. First time? Maybe, your first time or an interesting time when you were working with designers. Uh, I cannot quite think about the top of my head. <laughs> 
But I think that if you look at our, you know, the TV design, mm -hmm. the launch bar, mm -hmm. you know, previously our smart TVs are pretty much, when you click on smart button, it occupied the whole screen, mm -hmm. you know, kind of pushing a lot of content to the, to, the, to the user. Now we kind of try to avoid that with the launch bar, with the, you know, past and present concept in, in, that, in this launch bar. Mm -hmm. I think it really, you know, uh, changed the, you know, mindset of many people in terms of how we design. I think that it is really very impactful in that regard. Um, yeah, it's a huge success. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here's a really hard question. This is going to be fun. What will be the most important feature for the next big thing after the smartphone? <sighs> Probably you don't expect me to say about Internet of Things. Sure. Yeah. Actually, you know, <laughs> you know th I guess some of you may, may read this article by the famous professor in Harvard, the, the Michael Porter. Uh -huh. He was saying it's not really about Internet of Things, but it's about smart and connected devices. Mm -hmm. It is really changing the whole industry and ecosystem. I, I believe in that. So I don't know whether you can say it is Internet of Things or smart connected devices, but definitely the products with the Internet connection mm -hmm. Things are changing very, very rapidly. So you, you make me think about one evolution that I see happening where currently we have a smartphone or a smart watch, but we don't have a lot of examples where the things are working together intelligently. Mm -hmm. they are sometimes maybe the phone is driving the watch, but having them collaborate in some way, and maybe those aren't the best de devices to give us examples, but say, uh, the, the smart thermostat with my smart fire uh, detector, having them collaborate more intelligently, things like that. Yeah. Do you see that as uh, a growing trend and enabling new capabilities? Yeah, I think that you know, also in, uh, you know, in addition to that, I think that uh, because devices get connected to the, to, to the Internet, we are talking about uh, cloud, big data. Yeah. So you collect all this data to find, to find the human behavior. Right. be able to you know s service more intelligently i think that's a huge opportunity there mm -hmm. yeah so do you think that's the, the the big promise of internet of things is being able to um, model and predict human behaviors and and needs and then serve those proactively or what do you think is the big promise of internet of things to the end user uh, i think that uh, i don't know i think that it will be able to kind of predict what the, 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 that particular person wants, mm -hmm. kind of predict in advance, do something without having to say, do this or do that. I think that there is such a big you know, promise in there. That's my opinion, yeah. And then um, I think last question I have is, what do you think is the role of smart TVs in Internet of Things? Is it just going to be a control hub or is it more than that? Well, I think that, uh, you know, now, you know, TVs, you turn off when you do not watch TV anymore. Right. But I think that the, in time, the TV will have uh, another feature that will be on all the time, be able to know what the, the user wants, including the, you know, the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. so that it is not only becoming the hub of the, you know, the, the home network, so to speak, but many other opportunities like, uh, you know, being able to store many things that you want to keep around and also be able to, you know, s send and receive messages as well. Many other possibilities. The TV has a lot of potential there.